Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending January 9th, 2016. And first up, this was from Navy Thomas 8. This is, it's the same thing I talked about many times. It's another form of a helmet with a built-in camera, but this time it comes from Bell Helmets. The title of the article is New Camera Equipped Helmet Puts Eyes on Your Head, and it's from foxnews.com. But what gives me hope this time is it's a really cool camera. It's a detachable pod type of camera that uh, attaches or detaches to the top of the helmet. You can have a 4K 360 degree view using this type of camera here, or you can use the, it'll do the standard 16 by 9 footage. But because Bell is behind it, I think we may finally see the prices going into the reasonable range here. They say prices have not re been revealed, but the conventional versions of the helmets range from about $150 to $450, and the uh, camera part is $500. So if you combine them together, get some volume going. I'm hoping even if the retail says it's going to be around $600, bucks, you may be able to find them for around $450. Uh, off the bat and if you look at places like Amazon or discount places to find it like that because they really need to get them down to the sweet spot like maybe $399, uh, $349 would be better. That's the real, real sweet spot if they can get a combination camera and helmet down to that sweet spot and if anybody can do it, Bell can do it because they're known for affordable helmets and they're good quality helmets too. I've got two of them and I really like the Bell helmets. So. I don't think you need to necessarily, and I'm not putting it down. If that if that's your kind of deal, go with the Shoei helmets and stuff like that that cost six seven hundred bucks. But uh, I think you can get a pretty good functional helmet for a, a lot less money from a place like Bell or or other places besides. But hoping this on the horizon shows something that uh, can be affordable to your average people that do moto vlogs. And this next one is kind of like, uh, most of it's kind of a rehack of what I talked about before about Elon Musk and his uh, rocket that went up into uh, outer space and landed back successfully. But something about this statement too, and this is from valuewalk.com, the title is Tesla CEO Musk says reusable rockets key to Mars colony. That really piques my interest because if anything you know, I am totally into the Mars thing. So I'll just read the one part of it, the statement from Elon Musk here, and then the rest of the stuff kind of rehashes what we already talked about, about the rocket, the uh, Blue Origin rocket and his rocket um, to rocket the Falcon 9. That, but here's his statement. It makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely fundamental, Musk explained excitedly in an interview after the su successful Falcon 9 launch and landing. And I think it, the rocket landing, really dramatically improves my confidence that a city on Mars is possible. You know, that's what all this is about. Not one to shy away from the little strategic hype. A couple of weeks ago at the fall meeting of the American Geophysical Union in San Francisco, Musk gave a speech where he said, a colony on Mars would result in numerous major scientific advances, would notably lower humanity's odds of extinction, and would be a great adventure story to inspire and intrigue people around the world. I think if... If NASA can't come up with the full funding for it, if we could get SpaceX on board and possibly some other private entrepreneurs to sponsor this too, um, you know, maybe the guy that owns Virgin Airlines, a few others to come on board with a little bit of bucks, maybe we can actually make it to Mars in the next 10 or 15 years. I mean, I know NASA claims that's the goal, but they don't have the budget to do it right now, not unless they get a lot of extra money. But with something like this, I think it's actually, it's actually possible in the next 15 years. We could do it. And this next one, I just kind of found out myself looking around. This is a YouTube channel called Mousetrap Genius. And this guy is just cool. That's that's basically what his channel is about, is just trying out different types of, uh, of mousetraps. And this one that I'm going to give you, this particular video here, is from July 6th of 2013, where he tries out four different types of humane traps. So it's not necessarily a channel that's going to gross you out. It's not just about the kind of traps where it, you know, squishes the little mouse or something like that. It's a, He shows a lot of different humane traps. Now, I particularly am used to having to set mouse traps living in a place that's next to a wooded area. Even though I live in the suburbs and not out, not out in the country, there's an abandoned quarry just across the alleyway from me. So every year I've got mouse invasion that I have to deal with. It's uh, It takes probably about maybe I have to get rid of three or four of them before I'm pretty sure that they're clear for uh, the winter time because like everything else the creatures want the warm area. They're not stupid. They're like human beings. They'd rather be in the warm areas than out in the cold. So I have to deal with that too. But if you get a chance check it out. I mean to me it's just part of you know what geeks are about. I mean, mouse traps are a geeky thing, and the different ways of the designs and stuff like that, and the flaws. He even points out some of the flaws in the design. How sometimes the mouse will actually trip the trap, um, especially the main traps. There's ways they could trip them without actually, you know, getting caught inside the trap. But if you get a chance, uh, check it out. He's really cool. 
And then the last op, this was sent to me by Brian D. Kodak goes retro with new Super 8 camera. I first saw this and then looked at the picture at the top, which you'll see here too, and it really looks like a cool 8mm camera design. And I thought, aha, they just took an 8mm style camera design and put the digital circuitry into it. No, they're actually going back to Super 8 film. They're talking about analog Super 8 film inside this camera. And I think it's going to cost something like 56 bucks a, a roll to develop this stuff. I don't know. I mean, to me, I think it's just another failed idea. I mean, they came out in 2013, I think it was, came out of bankruptcy. And uh, with some help from the studios, they're actually, Kodak is actually back into the film business. Now, I can see for artists that have money to spend and certain directors and stuff like that that like it, 35 millimeter and 70 millimeter film is probably not going away anytime soon. And since the studios got together and helped Kodak with the cost of it, Kodak is back into the film business, but as far as Super 8, they are going to direct this. They said, I don't, I don't think consumers will even take to this at all, but they said they're going to direct this to film students. I don't really know with the, the limited budgets that schools have already and people talking about the costs and everything. Why would you really pay the extra for having students have to go through that with uh, purchasing the film, processing it, and paying for all that when you can have reusable high def or now even, I'm sure most of the good stu student uh, film schools now are probably even dealing with 4K cameras. They probably use that one called the RED camera and others like that. So they've definitely got the resolution. I just see this as another way that Kodak is really going to fizzle out with a bad idea. It's rather a shame, too, because Kodak was the first ones to come up with a digital still camera. I mean, they were the actual first ones to market with the digital still cameras, but then after that, boy, I don't know. So if you want to on the comments, give me your opinion on what do you think about Kodak's idea for doing this. I, I think it's the exact wrong way. I mean, I can see going with some of the vintage stuff as far as the vintage looks, you know, make a cool 8mm camera or something like that, but have it be digital inside, even if it's not. It doesn't even have to be the best of the best. A lot of us would just buy a decent, uh, maybe uh, a camera that's uh, somewhere between uh, a simple point and shoot and a GoPro camera. It doesn't have to be like 350 400 bucks, but let's just say a, a medium type of quality camera, but with a retro look on the outside. That would be kind of cool, you know, make it look like an old 8 millimeter camera or maybe even an old box camera or something like that. But yeah, don't, uh, don't take us back to the times where we're going to do processing and stuff like that. I mean, you also have the shot, too, that you might end up buying this thing. You might be really into the 8mm and like it a lot. You buy the 8mm camera, you buy like about maybe 20, 30 uh, rolls of film, and by the time you get about half the film developed, uh, it, it totally, you know, it totally does not, it just fizzles out in the market, and you're stuck with all the others and nobody to develop it, because to be able to develop the film, you have to have a lab that's willing to develop 8mm, and I just, I don't know. I don't see it as making it, but I still see 35mm and 70mm film worthwhile to invest in when you have studios with big budgets and stuff. Uh, let me know your thoughts and your comments, and as usual, take care everybody. I will catch you next week.